Praise God. Happy Father's Day to all the dads that are here uh, from Breath of Life. My name is Pastor Tony. Uh, man, these lights are bright. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I told him to get some more light, and he did. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, oh, children are dismissed. Thank you. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. <sighs> Sister? Amen. Welcome those of you joining us on live stream. Praise the Lord. Happy Father's Day to you dads that are tuning in. Amen. You know, like I said, today is Father's Day. And I want to commend all the dads that are here, all the dads that are watching here this morning, but dads, let's face it, there's a price you pay. And some of you single moms, you're wearing two hats. And there's a price you pay too as a mom and also as a surrogate dad because you have that awesome responsibility. Do you realize that when there's not a dad in the house, the children are 5% more likely to turn to drugs. 20% more than the national average to end up in prison. Dads play an awesome role, and when they're not there, they're not taking their role as the leadership of their family, the family underneath them crumbles. It doesn't mean everything has to be all right all the time, but just the fact that their presence is there Bring stability to the home. I encourage you fathers this morning. As the beginning of my message, the price we must pay, not only as dads, but you moms as well. It's a partnership. And the price you pay in bringing up your children, because they're innocent. They're depending on you dads and you moms to raise them upright. And what we do this while they're young will be a precedent to when they grow up. So if you're treating them right, you're disciplining them right, you're getting them to church, and they're hearing the gospel, you know that when they get older, the Bible says they shall not depart from the Bible. Oh, they may rebel. They may refuse to go to church, but eventually, because you took the time to instill that in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Yes, there's times for vacation. That's okay. But because now we have live streaming, there is no time where we can't miss the message. Why? Because all you need is a phone. And you can tune in on your vacation while you're sitting on the beach and you're watching a message to lift you up, to encourage you. Some people say, dads are not good enough. We're not doing enough. The wives will maybe complain, you're working too hard. You're working too much. Dads, be careful. It's not the buck that those kids want. They need your love. They need your attention. You need to nurture your wife. That's your family. And yes, you want those nice things, but at what cost? What price are you going to pay to have the nice things working that extra day, and meanwhile your children and your wife are suffering with neglect because you're not there? Sometimes we don't know how to discipline our children. That is why sometimes dads feel like failures. Today, our message to you, Dad, is that we need to destroy the strongholds of our thinking. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It's gone. It's history. It's in the record books. It's what you do today and looking forward. Paul says we don't wage war as the world does because the weapons of our warfare is of divine power. We need to take every thought captive and, and submit it to the word of God. And dads, 
The wives are depending on you. The children are depending on you. You are the leader of your home. You're the one that sets precedent. This is what we're going to be like in my home. You have children. You have girls. They're reaching that age to where they want to start dating. Dad says, no. They can't date until they're 17. I know as a school teacher, how many times did I see girls that were pregnant before they were 16 years old, unmarried? Because I bet you there was not a dad in place to say, "Uh uh-uh. Anybody to come to see my daughter has to see me first. And when you have a relationship with your daughter and your sons, you let them know, this is what we stand for. And if you're church going and you're involved in the church, guess what? The children are going to follow suit. Divorce, out of the question. There is no word that should come into your mouth. Dads of divorce, you struggle, work it out. Because divorce will destroy not only your relationship, but it will destroy the children that are looking towards you for guidance. How can we say we're Christians and because your husband or a dad doesn't do what he's supposed to do, I want a divorce? Oh, it's easy to say that. You pay 250 bucks and it's done. But who suffers the most? The children. Because they don't understand what's going on. The grandchildren don't understand what's going on. Divorce should not happen. Not having a father scars the children. I know, sometimes we get backed into a corner. Your wife wants that extra air conditioner or wants that uh, laundry machine or vacuum cleaner or she wants a new dress and you ain't got the money. And you're working hard trying to put the meat on the table. Divorce. Some of you guys are divorced, had to pay alimony, and it's wiped out your, your account. And you can't make your commitments to your new family because you're paying for your mistakes of the before. And who suffers? Not only God with your tithes because you don't tithe, but your family suffers. How can you possibly look your, parents, your family in the eye and say, follow God, trust God, when you're not trusting God? with your finances, it's because of divorce that's got in the mix of it. I struggle myself. I'm not a good role model. I was 18, 19 years old, had a son. My wife left me. Instead of fighting for my son, as a young kid, I walked away. And now I'm paying the price but not being there for him. The scars that was given to me have now been passed on to my child, my son. Later on in life, I was still so angry, I had another scar. I gave birth to a daughter, the girl that I had, pregnated. She gave birth to a daughter. And I gave her up because I was a drug addict. Now I'm reliving those scars, and every single day I pray to God, oh God, forgive me. Don't take out my curse on them. Reveal yourself to them. And some dads may be sitting here right now, and you're reliving those mistakes that you made when you were younger. But you can't bring them back. It's too late. But we can be praying as dads today and say, oh, God, you saved me. Now save my children. Romans. Got your Bibles. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 18. It says this. The price we pay is the message title today. Everything we do has consequences. Oh, you may get by, but somewhere down the road, you got to pay the piper. 
Well, pastor, I, I didn't come to church, or I didn't tithe, or I didn't read my Bible. It's okay. I'm still here. I'm all right. Uh, you're not all right. Because somewhere down the road, there's a pothole waiting for you, and you're going to fall into it as dads. And you're going to say, where did this come from? It's because you sowed seed back here of irresponsibility. But today, you're going to change all that. Today, you're going to say, I, in my house, we're going to serve God. That means you grab your family together and you sit down and you sit down over dinner and you sit down in the morning or in the evening and you open up the Bible and you gather your children, you turn the TVs and the radios and the cell phones off and you pray over your family and you let your children know that I am the priest of this family. This is how we are going to live in our house. At first they're going to rebel because they're not used to it. But trust me, over time, they're going to love you for it. Because when they get old and they have children of their own, they're going to look back and say, hey, my dad didn't start out that way, but man, something happened to him. He, they, he met Jesus. So let's pray this morning. Let's pray that your hearts, dads, hear me. It's not a beat-up session. Pray that your heart's open to receive this. And if you're walking down that road, as the scriptures start to unveil, then we need to repent of what we've done and say, i got to make a change. Just bow your heads with me. Live stream also. Father, we come into your presence right now. The price we pay as dads is an awesome responsibility. Some dads were young when they had their children. Some are middle-aged. And sometimes we don't understand the consequences of our decisions until it's too late. Help us to realize that everything that we say, everything that we do or not do, is consequences. Help us today, Lord, to have a receiving spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Don't let us lock it out and say, I know it all. Because pride will destroy men. Pride will destroy man. Give us a teachable spirit today, Lord God. Help us to understand that we can't do it by ourselves. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to come in and change this heart, sometimes made out of stone, and give us ears to hear. And we thank you. Amen. Romans 8.18 says this. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared, oh, it's up there, and worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. Verse 19, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Drop down to verse 22. What happens? We know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves who have first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Next verse. For in this hope, we were saved. We hope for what is already, we already have. Verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. How many times do you hear in the world, let's live today because tomorrow we're going to die. There was a story, I grew up playing baseball. I'm on the East Coast. Here in, in the Southwest, they play soccer. In the East Coast, we play baseball. I grew up with a baseball bat on my bed and a glove and a ball. I lived not too far from Yankee Stadium, and I used to go there when I can. Back then, the tickets were only a dollar, and sometimes even 50 cents. And I would go visit my uncle on weekends. Why? Because he lived right across the street from Yankee Stadium. 
And I knew if I can just get to his house, he'd take me to the ball game. But there was a special player. One of my idols, sorry to say, his name was Mickey Mantle. And this guy was groomed to be the greatest baseball player that ever lived. He had forearms like Popeye. He was only five foot nine and a half, but he had forearms like Popeye, and boy, he can swat the baseball. He hit the, the longest home runs in ever in baseball. At the end of his career, he had 536 home runs, close to a 300 batting average. And you know what he said as he lay dying of cancer of the liver because he was an alcoholic all his life? He said, my dad died early, and I figured I'm going to die too early. It's in the genes. So I'm going to do all I can to live today because tomorrow I'm going to die anyway. You see, men sometimes have a mentality that because their parents may have died of cancer or diabetes, that the same thing is going to happen to them. So what do they do? They cast the Bible aside and they start living for themselves, disregard about anything else. Why? Because they feel they're not going to be around to the end anyway. So why not live for today? Because tomorrow may never come. That's not so. As a Christian, that ought not to be our language. Yes, as believers, when we came to Christ, we thought that everything was going to be okay. But it's not. We struggle each and every day to put that bread on the table. Wife's mo- the wife's money is extra. She works because she wants to buy extra things. But you are the breadwinner. The buck stops with dads. Satan can no longer touch us. However, he harasses the dads. He harasses your mentality. He'll stir up your wife to cause an argument, and you fall into that trap every time, not realizing, wait a minute, how can she be loving yesterday, and today she's snarling at me? Easy. Because Satan got a hold of her, just like Satan got a hold of Peter, when Peter confronted Jesus and said, Jesus, you can't go to Jerusalem because they're going to crucify you. What did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. What was he saying? Was Peter possessed? No. But her, his humanality, her carnality, his love for Jesus got in the way of spiritual things, and he let down his guard and allowed Satan to speak those words through him, and Jesus saw where it was coming from and said, get behind me. So what happens, dads? Your wives get a hold of you, and they know how to push your buttons. Why? They know you better, and the only one that knows you better is the Holy Spirit. I said before in Romans 8.18, That the suffering more than once of the present is not worthy to compare about the glory that's going to come. We spend all of our time fighting in disagreements with each other instead of realizing, wait a minute. Where are we going to end up? We're going to end up in heaven. Why are we squabbling over something here now when we should be casting our eyes on Jesus and let this problem just fall behind us? It's not worthy of my attention to deal with that. Love your wives. Love your children. Protect your children. Provide for your children. Take care of them. Spend time with them. And you watch the change in your household, dads. You watch how your wife is going to become more sweeter, more lovely. And when you drop your clothes at the the doorstep after she's cleaned the house, she won't bite your neck off. Why? Because you've been nice to her the whole week. We're going to suffer as saints 
There's nobody sitting here or watching me right now is not going to suffer. If you think you're not going to suffer, you're living in Disneyland, fantasy land. Because Jesus said, we are going to go through hard times. But Satan knows his time is short. He knows he only has a short time before Jesus is going to return and call us saints. If we're still alive, we're going to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. Somebody give me an amen. amen. Those uh, uh, that died already and they knew Christ as their Lord and Savior will be shot up out of the graves or out of the ocean. And meet Jesus in the air. And we're going to keep on suffering. It's not going to be easy being a Christian. Otherwise, everybody would be here. Today, people want a cushy message. They want it to be nice and easy. Don't ruffle my feathers, Pastor. Why don't you speak softly and put that stick away? Maybe more people will come. No, they won't. Because if you're speaking the true word of God, it comes with a sword. So, what is suffering? Is it sickness? Is it pain? How do you identify what sickness is? Is it misery? Is it depression, loneliness, poverty, mistreatments, sorrow? Persecution, trouble, what is suffering? We got to focus not on the suffering part, but we must focus today on the glory of God. Too many times we look about what mistakes we've made instead of casting our eyes on Jesus and say, Jesus, I need you now more than ever because we're all going to go through suffering times. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For the light and momentary troubles are achieving for us the eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You know what that means? All of your pain, all of your sickness, all of your depression, all of your loneliness, it's temporary. It's not going to last long. Why? We serve a heavenly father. He's not going to sit back on his stool and say, yeah, devil, you can go and beat up my son or daughter for until eternity. No, it's only temporary compared to what's waiting for us when we get to heaven. Eternal glory. No pain, no sickness, no depression, no fighting with your wife, only happiness. Look at verse 18. For we fix our eyes not on what we seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul is giving us a roadmap. Dads, you got to follow the roadmap. How many times we get our families in the car and we're going on vacation, we're going to Flagstaff, we're going to Tucson or California or, or the south of the border, and, and the wife is sitting next to you and, and she pulls out the map or she pulls out GPS and your dad goes, no, I got it, don't worry about it, I know exactly where I'm going. Two hours down the road, honey, I'm lost. <laughs> Why? Because we think we know it all. You see, God has given us a roadmap. He's given us a GPS. He's saying, don't go by what you see. Because sometimes what is seen is misleading you. The world says that we are going to face these sufferings in order to appreciate the blessing. You can't appreciate the blessings of God unless you suffered. For me, I've been suffering all my life. And these past 30 years have been the most beautiful in my life. 
No. I have two failures that I'm still praying for, but I'm praying for a miracle that God will touch them supernaturally. Let somebody come by their way and tell them about Jesus. And they'll get saved, because I have. Paul is telling us not to lose hope. So when you look at your situation in life and things are going badly for you, maybe the husband and wife, you're arguing with each other all the time. You never seem to be on the same page with each other. It seems like you're going west and she's going east. Paul is telling us, don't lose hope. It's going to work out. Look at verse 16. For which cause we faint not, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Every day we're getting stronger and stronger. Not our physical body, our spiritual body. Because if we're spending time in the word of God, the spiritual body is going to get stronger and stronger and not lose hope. Look at 1 Peter, verse 1, 7. It says this. These have come so that proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor in Jesus Christ. Think about it. You may be sitting here, and you got $3 in your pocket. And you say, we're a failure. Dad, I'm a failure. I can't provide for my failure. No, you're not a failure. You're not a failure. That's a lie from Satan. You've got to stop leaving, believing what Satan is telling you and believe what God is saying. He's saying this, you're being refined. In your suffering, something is happening to you on the inside. Not to lose hope, but then you're suffering in your state of weakness. God is doing something on the inside, man. And he's building you up. Why? Because something more important is coming down the road. And he's strengthening the inner man. Because what you're going through doesn't compare to what's coming. Because every day that goes by, Satan knows his days are numbered. And he's unleashing all sorts of wickedness. And dads, you are going to be put on the firing line because he's coming after you first. Why? He knows if he can get to you, he's going to get to your wife and then your children and then your grandchildren, and he's destroyed the whole lot. Peter says this. We ought to rejoice. When I had my stents put in six months ago, I rejoiced. Why? There was a time of suffering, but now the joy came in because now I'm a better man. I'm a stronger man. Why? The blood is flowing, just like Jesus' blood is flowing through our veins. I don't know how it happened. I can't give you a five-step program. All I know is this. It worked. But I had to suffer first. I had to realize that in my weakest state, that's when God appeared. And sometimes we want to make rash decisions because the things that we're doing right now, dads, is not working out. As I spoke earlier, divorce, it's a killer. The wife is unhappy. She wanted Sir Lancelot. And she ended up with Moby Dick. They build up the man so high that he can't come down off his chariot. Not so. We're just flesh and blood, wives. We men are just flesh and blood. We love you, and we do the best that we can. Doesn't mean that we're perfect. Somebody give me an amen. amen. But if we love Jesus, what does Jesus tell us? Forgive, pray, love each other. Because you're, if you're not doing those three things, you've got to ask yourself, am I really a Christian? 
Or am I a hypocrite? Why? Because we want things our way, not God's way. Peter goes on to say that we have to remain faithful to Christ in the midst of your suffering. It's easy to pack your suitcase and say, I'm out of here. This church here hasn't grown in 12 years to where I want it to be. Sayonara, folks, I'm out of here. It's easy to say that for a pastor, but no. That's when I dig in and say, you lousy devil, Uh uh-uh. I'm not going to allow you because there's people getting saved. There's people getting baptized. There's people being redeemed. Lives are being restored. It doesn't matter about the numbers. It matters on one individual that got changed. Then the ministry is a success. But too many times we say, hey, I'm out of here. Adios, compadre. This church is dead. No, no. This church ain't dead. You're dead. You're dead. Because if you can see dead in somebody else, what you're looking at is a mirror. And you're seeing yourself as dead. So the best thing to do is to deflect and blame others. See, that's the devil's ploy. He wants us dads to deflect and say, we're not going to take responsibility for our actions. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to pray. I don't have to read my Bible with my kids. I don't have to give tithes and offerings. I'll just skate on by and hold up my hands and say I'm a Christian. We're living in a lie. And he's blinded some dads to say, I believe in it. I'm still here. I still got blessings. And what we do is we look at the physical blessings and say, God must be for me. Otherwise, why would he give me these things? You got to ask your question. Who's giving it to you? God or Satan? See, sometimes Satan works to get your mind off of what you need to do as dads and following the word of God. And he'll give you these temporary blessings. But down the road, you're going to pay the piper. Your children will be rebellious and leave the church. Your wife will end up walking out on you. But God says, no. This is the time we buckle in, man. This is the time where we dig a trench. Can't bring back the mistakes. Your children have left you. They're on their own now. Can't change them. You're above 18, but we can pray. We can pray for them. It starts with purity of faith. I believe, Lord, if I pray and change my wicked ways, that you will hear the cries of my heart. Because Joel says it in chapter 2, verse 25, I will restore what the canker worm or the devil has taken from you, dads. He's going to bring back your children. He's going to restore those relationships. No, you can't get that relationship with the woman back. Why? Because you're married now again. But he's going to restore your relationship with your children so you can break that cycle of sin passed on from father to son, from son, father to son. It's a curse. If you read Deuteronomy, you'll know what I'm talking about. Jesus looked down, and he sees our suffering. He's not blind to it. He knows some of your dads are struggling, doing the best that you can. He sees that. He's not overlooking your pain and your suffering and your hurt. He wants to give us faith that in the midst that we want to throw in the towel and walk away, He's still there. Jesus said, he promised us, it's not going to be an easy life. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 through 23. The time we spend on earth is like a blade of grass. I used to have a yard when we started this church in my house 13 years ago. I had a big yard of grass in the backyard. I used to love it. A 
a city person like me sitting on a lawnmower, woohoo! If only my friends knew what I've become. And I cut the grass, and sometimes I didn't pick up the grass, I let it sit there. And before I cut it, it was green. And the dogs would go over there and they eat the grass because, I don't know, some, something about grass dogs love. And they eat the grass, I think it helps their digestion. But after I cut the grass, it turned brown. Peter's saying, we're just like that. Today you're alive, you're strong, man, you're strong, got all the abilities to do things. But all of a sudden you're going to get cut down one day. Here today, gone tomorrow. First Peter says this, but with the precious blood of Jesus, lamb, without blemish or defect, verse 20, he was chosen before the creations of the world, but was revealed in these last days for your name's sake. Through him, you believed in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God Wives, hear this. Not in your husband. Don't put your faith in your husband. Put your faith in God that God will empower your husband. Okay? He'll get the job done because he doesn't have to answer to you. He's got to answer to God. Verse, next verse. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other. You know what that means? Loving your fellow Christians that are here. Loving your enemies that persecute you. Obeying the truth so that you have sincere love. Love one another deeply from the heart. James says, how can you say I love you, and in the next verse, you're cursing somebody. That ought not to be. When we start judging people, well, I only like you when you do something for me, but when you don't do nothing for me, later for you. Next verse. For you have been born again, not with perishable seed, but with imperishable through the living, enduring word of God. We're a new creation. Yes, our bodies are slowly deteriorating. But it doesn't mean the spirit man has to die. But if we're not spending time in the word of God, guess what happens? The enemy comes in like a flood and he starts perverting your thoughts and your actions. And he starts putting things into your head. As you think, you shall become. You see, Christ was our role model. He suffered far more than we can ever think about suffering in this world. The highest glory is to suffer for Jesus' sake. Well, I don't like suffering. I thought being a Christian, everything was going to be okay. I don't like this Christianity. I'm going to go to a church where all they talk about is blessings. Well, they're gonna, God's going to bless you. You're already blessed. You're already blessed. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. What else can man do and give you compared to the glory that's coming? But Satan has twisted our minds to say, no, how we measure success is how much we can hold in our palm of our hands. That's temporary. It's a blade of grass. It's here today and gone tomorrow. What remains is your obedience, not your sacrifice. Don't turn there, but Acts 9.16 says, I will show him how great he must suffer for my name's sake, Luke wrote. Paul's conversion and salvation meant a call to preach the gospel. Everybody here should be preaching the gospel to your unsaved loved ones. But pastor, I told them, but they don't listen. Okay. So you give up? Don't you discipline your children and they don't listen? What do you do? Let them go? Let them do what they want to do? 
Now they got a whole bunch of problem area children. I know, I used to have them in class. I knew exactly what the parents were doing by the sixth graders that came in my class and they couldn't sit still. They couldn't behave. They run around, didn't do their work. And when I went home to meet the parents, there's the, there's the problem. There's the source. Parents never sat them down and disciplined their children, never taught their children how to behave in church, in school. And that's the kind of generation we're raising. Churches can't discipline your children, folks. That's not our job. Dads, hear me. It starts at home. Train up a child in the ways of the Lord. When they get older, he won't depart from it. John 12, 24 says this. Jesus spoke and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies and abide alone. But if it dies, it brings forth fruit. Sometimes our flesh has to die. Your wants and your needs has to die. So the Spirit of God can birth something new in us. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. Because if you have not received the Holy Spirit, where is it going to come from? Because our thinking cannot fathom the mind of God. We need the Holy Spirit to inspire us on how to live a good life. But if all we want is to please ourselves, the Holy Spirit says, okay, you're on your own. And that's why marriages are falling apart. That's why children are disobedient. That's why some of them turn to gangs and drugs. And they end up like the 18-year-old in Texas and killing a whole bunch of kids. Where were the parents? I'm going to give you four steps in suffering saints. Write these down. Number one, if you're listening to me here and on live stream, and you're a Christian, you must be willing to suffer. You must be willing to suffer. 1 Peter 4.1 says this, Since Christ suffered and underwent pain, we must have the same attitude he did. You must be ready to suffer. For remember, when your body suffers, sin loses power. I know sometimes when I step out of line and I say something to my wife or I say something to a brother harshly and I walk away, that Holy Spirit comes down on me and says, why did you say that? Yeah, but God, uh, this person said so and so. Uh Uh-uh. It's not what you said, it's how you said it. Oh, and I have to go back and make it right. So when we're walking the spirit, we don't give in for the lust of the flesh. The flesh wants to be pampered. The flesh wants its own way. The flesh does not want to submit. So the flesh wants to do and how to serve God its own way, not God's way, their way. But you can't serve God if you have not submitted to Christ. It doesn't work. It's carnality. Look at verse 2. He says, you won't be spending the rest of your life chasing after evil desires, but you'll be anxious to do the will of God. We still got people in church and on live stream. They don't do the will of God. They do the will of self. Well, I'm waiting for something to fall out of heaven and tell me what I need to do. It's in the book. But we don't want to do that. So we deflect. I'm waiting for a holy encounter. I think people are waiting for doves, dads. They're waiting for doves to land on their, on their shoulder and whisper, this is what you need to do. You're out of the will of God. So what do you have to do? You have to make up for it. So we make up different things that we need to do to justify our rebellious attitude. You know why the church is suffering today? 
Praise God for the pandemic. You know what the pandemic did? It separated the sheep from the goats. The ones that are here are hungry for more of Jesus. They want Jesus in their life because it came that close to where some of us could have lost some of our loved ones. Just like 9-11, the churches were flooded. Here it was the opposite way. We couldn't get to church. So what does God do? He opens up a venue of live streaming. So if they can't make it here, they can still watch it. Am I making sense? This place is all quiet. Live stream, is it making sense? Amen. Number two, suffering for Christ is called suffering according to the will of God for his namesake. I was watching a, a, a documentary a documentary during Easter celebration in Mexico. And I'm not making fun of them because I'm Mexican, even though I was born here. But they would walk to the church. And on the week before Palm Sunday, they would grab a whole bunch of palms and they would walk to the church, beating themselves in the back until they became bloody to show how they have to suffer. That's not what the scripture meant. Christ already paid the price in his suffering by going to the cross. We've been spared that suffering. All we have to do is when we do suffer, God is allowing it to happen because he has something just on the other side that we can't see yet. There's a blessing on the other side, and it's out of our reach because we're suffering right now. We're being tested right now. Are we going to persevere in this suffering? Because I know, God, you're testing me. There ain't no sin in my life. I've confessed. If I had sin, I've confessed it. So I'm here, and I'm going through some suffering. But I know you're not just going to leave me here bloodied, but there's a blessing coming right out of my reach. But if I give up and I lose hope, the blessing goes right on by. Maybe that's you today. Maybe if you feel because you suffered so much in your life that God's blessing has passed you by. No, it isn't. Sometimes he allows the pain and the suffering to go on. Why? Because we got a rebellious spirit. We want it done our way, not his way. And so we give God, God, you got to do it this way. Because if you don't do it this way, I ain't doing nothing. And God says, okay, do nothing. But one day you're going to have to stand in front of me. And the Bible says give an account for all that you did or did not do. Somebody give me an amen. amen. Acts 9, 16 says this, For I will show you how much more we have to suffer. Spiritual death must work in believers in order for God's life to flow. When I get spirit-flowing spirit believers, guess what? Pastor says, hey, I need something. Bam! They just do it. They don't say, hey, Pastor, I'm too tired. Uh, I got something else to do. No. What do you need? But people that are not make the excuses. And then they wonder why they're not seeing the blessings or their miracles or their children or their grandchildren getting saved. Why? Because those blessings are not there. Why? Because back here, you haven't submitted yourself in your suffering to say, God, I'm sorry. I've been doing Christianity my way, but now I realize I need to do it your way. And when we do, something supernatural happens. When you speak, people get saved. People get healed. Paul reminds us of that victorious life. It's no easy way. I'm not going to give you a five-step program on how to be spiritual. I'm still working at it. I still struggle. I still go through periods of doubt and fear. But I know who to go to when that happens. I may fall today, but tomorrow I get right back up and say, God, I'm sorry for being in that muck and mire I don't like being there. Lord, forgive me. 
Give me a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit so I can be renewed and strengthened today. Give me the mind of Christ. And all of a sudden, the things I was not doing that I've committed not to do any longer, all of a sudden, I prayed the prayer of faith asking God through the Holy Spirit to enlighten me, to touch my mind. You see, when people come to church, the unsaved, the pastors go for their mind first before they get to the heart. Because if I speak to the heart, the mind's going to say, uh-uh, I ain't buying into that. But once you believe up here, I am a sinner, and I am going to hell for my sins because I'm breaking most of the commandments in my life. I know I need a Savior. And then when the pastor preaches a message, and all of a sudden, bam, the Holy Spirit just drops down on them. Why? Because they're submissive. They're repentive. They say, oh, God, I've been doing it my way, and I'm so sorry. Not coming to the altar saying, yeah, what can you do for me, pastor? God ain't going to do nothing for you. Why? Because you got to come broken, not with pride. Number three, suffering for Christ brings on spiritual maturity. I can always know when I meet a spiritual Christian. Oh, it's so obvious. Just like when I go out in the street, I can sense drug addicts a mile away. As soon as they come out, I look into their eyes, I know exactly where they've been. I don't know what kind of drug they're using, but I know. Why? Because I've been there. And I can recognize it. And when you're a spiritual Christian, not that we're perfect, because we're not, I can spot another spiritual Christian. They're on fire for Christ. They're raising their hands. And they're praising God, even though they don't know the words. Why? Because it's not the words that they're doing it. They're raising their hands and saying, God, thank you, Lord, for another day. I'm just going to sit here in the house of God, and I'm going to worship you. I'm going to love you. I'm just going to get closer to you. But the people that don't, the devil's got a hold of you. Maybe you had a fight on the way in to church. Maybe you had a flat tire. Maybe your husband or, or wife or children, something happened the night before. And you come to church, and you got your hands, or you're sitting down, and nothing happens. You see, folks, that's the time spiritual maturity kicks in. Even though you may have had a fight and there are times my wife and I had a fight coming to church. And guess what? I don't care. I'm going to say, God, forgive me, but I want to get closer. I need you now more than ever. That's maturity. So the next time we come together, you start raising your hands. Don't let the devil lie to you and say, you can't get here on time. Hello? We start at 10.15, get here on time. Why? Those songs are not songs to, to do kumbaya. They're songs to get us into the presence of Jesus. Why? Because sometimes we have baggage from last week to today. Sometimes we've gone through work and the boss is on your back or he gave you extra work or you don't have enough money to pay your bills or, or, or buy gas. And, you, and you're loaded down. And all of a sudden, you come into the, into the sanctuary. And all of a sudden, they start playing Christian songs. And all of a sudden, you raise up your hand saying, God, I don't know what the song is, but I want to worship you. I want to love you. Why? Because I'm saved. I know now that I'm going to suffer. I know now I don't have to understand what the suffering is. I'm just going to trust you that you're going to get me through this. And when I get to the other side, there will be a blessing there waiting for me. Somebody give me an amen. amen. Hebrews, turn there, chapter 2, verse 10. <clears throat> In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists, 
should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. We're perfected in our suffering. I'm sorry, I've, when I was a Christian, first couple of years, God was merciful to me. Nothing wrong happened. Then I backslid, and all hell broke loose. I said, hey, God, what's going on? And he spoke to my spirit. You know why, son? Yeah, why? It's because you stopped doing what you did when you first loved me. Oh, oh, I get it. You see, what happens if we don't get back to where we first fell in love with Jesus, our hearts get cold. That's why it's hard to reach it. Sorry, no offense. It's hard to reach an old person for Christ. Why? They got 50, 60, 70 years of living in the world, and they're crusted over, and they don't want to hear nothing because they think, hello, they know it all. And when you tell them about a Jesus, a Savior, they don't want to hear it. That's why we catch them young. If you can't come to church, good. Drop off your kids. Let's have your kids. We'll teach them. And maybe when they get home, they'll teach you. I got one amen. amen. The rest of you are in denial. Amen. It's okay. You got to deal with him, not me. This is not saying that Jesus needed to be made perfect. We're not perfect. Oh, did you see what pastor did? Yeah, I did. I raised my voice. Pray for me. But you're supposed to be perfect. Where? Show me where it says I have to be perfect. Oh, but Jesus said be perfect because I am perfect. He wasn't talking about the physicality. How can I be perfect in this body suit that I'm in? Flesh. It was born in sin. And that's all it can do is sin. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. Spirit in us to guide us into all righteousness. You can't be perfect unless you've got the Holy Spirit living in you to remind you that when you do something wrong, dads, he's on you like a cheap suit. Oh, what did I just do to my wife? I yelled at her. Why? I yelled at my kids because, oh, I didn't have my dinner on the table. Oh, my goodness. It was cold. Oh, uh, I, wanted, I wanted peas and carrots, and she gave me broccoli. Oh, my goodness. When we go through suffering, we're not going through it alone, folks. Sometimes when people suffer, they isolate themselves. They go on an island. Well, i, I got to think this through. That's when the devil just comes on you and attacks our mind. And he'll pound your mind until oblivion. Because you can't figure it out because God is allowing the suffering to happen. So you come to repentance and say, God, not my way, but your way. And you can try to finagle it. You can try to uh, scheme some other plan to get around your problems. But guess what? You're still going to end up on the same detour because you ain't getting away. God paid a heavy price for your sins. And you ain't getting away. And you can go any place you want to. And guess what? The devils will be right there too. Waiting for you. Ha ha! I knew you'd come. Yeah. Lastly, in living for Christ and the gospel suffering should not be sought, but willing to accept as part of our commitment to Christ. You see, when we suffer... We're committing to Christ that, Lord, I know somewhere down there, I don't look for it. Don't get me wrong. I don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, man, I can't wait to suffer today. I, oh, it's so jolly. It's good. No, I don't do that. But when it does come, I say, okay, God. Past four years, I've been beat up in my body. Some of you I know. I know your story. You've been beat up, too. Hey, God, hey, what are you doing? What about them? Can't you hit them for a little bit and give me a break? No. Why? 
Because God's got something special for those that are suffering right now. He's got a blessing coming your way. But you got to submit and say, God, this I don't understand, but I know pastor has preached it. He's adamant. He's getting aggressive on me. He's passionate. I, I'm starting to feel it on the inside. Now I know where the problems are coming from. Now I know why. Because you can read your Bible until you're blue in the face, but it ain't going to change a heart that's stone cold and a mind that's unchanged. Because if your mind is doing what you want to do, Holy Spirit ain't there. But the minute you say, Lord, give me the mind of Christ, so when you think, you're thinking the way Christ thinks, and then when you make a decision, say, Lord, what do you think? Speak to my wife. Touch her heart and mine. We got too many macho dads over here. They make all the decisions. And they leave their wife over here like uh, baby makers. Excuse me? We left that, that stone age. We got spiritual women in this church. Some are dormant, but we got spiritual women that we're raising up. Why? God is speaking a word in these last days to women as well. But we have to make ourselves available. Look at 1 Peter 1.12. It was revealed to them. It was revealed to them. 1 Peter 1.12. They were not serving themselves, but you. Did you hear that first phrase? It was revealed. It was revealed to them. But when they spoke of the things that now have been told, you by those who have perished, who preached the gospel, to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. In the last days, the Holy Spirit is revealing God's plan. It's in the scriptures. All you have to do is search the scriptures and say, Lord, put me in a spirit of obedience to do what needs to be done. I'm no longer waiting for the dove on my shoulder before I do anything and then call myself a Christian. Because one day, we're going to have to give an account for what we didn't do with that free gift. And I tell you right now, there are going to be a lot of Christians that don't make it. We're talking about all denominations. They're not going to make it. In closing, listen, here's your, here's your test, folks. Live stream, listen. Are you willing to suffer for Christ as he suffered for us? Because if you're not willing to suffer, everything that I said this morning is in one ear, out the other, and you're just going to go on your way. I did my duty for an hour and a half, and psh, I got till next Sunday before I get beat up. Next, if you're willing to suffer, it's, here's, here's the gift. It's going to produce gold in your life. Here's the gold. In your suffering, I learned this, did a little word study. When they get gold out of the, out of the mountains and the caves of Africa where gold is, is harvested, guess what? They have to put it in a refinery. And in this refinery, it's 2,000 degrees. Why? Because when they get the gold out of the, out of the earth, it doesn't look like gold that we're accustomed to seeing. So they have to put the fire to it to melt off the dross. And that dross is some of the stuff that we put on every day. When we think we're so spiritual, we become crusty. We've become judgmental. we become separated from God. We think we're on our own island. We think we don't have to be accountable to nobody. We think we, we come to church and the pastor does everything. And I just sit here and receive. What's going to happen? And he's saying, if you're submitting your spirit today, I'm going to put you through the fire. Things are going to happen in your life it's going to happen to your children and your children's children. 
If that's the way I got to get through to you, I will. Some of us paid a price and ended up in jail or prison. Some of us have lost loved ones. And if that didn't awake you, God doesn't put his pedal off. He puts it even on more. Why? Because he loves us. Now, are you willing now to know that now you're ready for the master's hand to become spiritually mature? See, he ain't going to do it for those carnal Christians that only want to receive, but they don't want to give nothing. They don't want to do nothing. They just want to sit here and warm a seat. Pastor, you're preaching too hard. Hey, it's in the word. Don't yell at me. Yell at the word. James says, don't be a hearer. Be a doer of the word. Are you willing to know? Are you willing to accept a suffering as part of your Christian commitment? Because if you can answer all of these in the right way, guess what? If you can say, yes, pastor, I'm ready. Or you can say, pastor, I ain't ready yet. Okay, your choice. But guess what? The problems, the headaches, the arguments, the fights, the loneliness, the fear, it's all going to be there, and it's going to mount up and mount up until you deal with it. I don't know about you. I wake up every morning, the first thing out of my mouth is, Lord, I, first of all, I love you this morning. I mean, I haven't even got my eyes open because I got the stuff in my eyes. I can't open my eyes, and my wife has to come with the stuff in my eyes. And I'm like, Lord, I just love you this morning. Forgive me of my sins. And then my eyes starts opening up. Why? I want this vessel to be clean. That when I make my prayers and petition, he hears them. Because if we're not obedient to God, your prayers sound like a gong. It doesn't go past the roof. And that's why we need to surrender today. Dads, you hear me? But you know what, moms? It's for you too. It's your pair. Single moms, sorry, you're in this too. You wear two hats. Stand, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. God is taking us to a spiritual place, folks. Guess what? It ain't easy. It ain't easy. A lot of sifting going on here and also in live streaming and out there in the world. Sifting is going on. He says, I'm going to sift the wheat. A farmer, when he goes into harvest, he takes the corn and he has to take his, his pitchfork and he sticks it in and throws it up the wheat into the air. And what happens, it separates the good from the bad. Sifting is going to take place. And the question is, are you going to embrace the sifting and say, Lord, take what's wrong in me and make it right. Take my mind that's been so rebellious of thinking I know what's best. Change my thinking because you know I love you. But because we love you doesn't mean that gives us a reason not to have our mind in the right place. God will straighten that out. He'll take your mind and say, daughter, son, I love you, but man, I don't know where you're getting this stuff from, but it ain't from me. And when you watch what God will do, you're going to be that gold refined in fire. You read chapter of 1 Peter. You talk. You read more about it. Just soak it in. Just soak it in. Say, Lord, that's me. I want to go through the fire. I, I, I want all the impurities out of me. I want all self. I want all pride. I want all things that don't give you honor and glory out of me. And I want more of Jesus in me. So when people look at me like they looked at Moses, they couldn't look at him. 
because the glory of the Lord was shining out of his face. We got Christians today walking with their heads down. That ought not to be because there's something lying inside. There's something lying inside that you're holding on to. And it ain't going to go away because you think it's going to go away. It's, it's God's going to say, give it to me because you can't get rid of it. And when you do that and you surrender, there's an old time song, I surrender all. Woo. When you surrender all, oh man, the Holy Spirit looks down and says, God says, Father, says, go get him. Tony's ready. And he comes down and he floods your soul with his presence, and man, it's a life-changing experience. And the joy is gonna flood you. Amen? Amen? Let's pray right now. If you feel led by the Holy Spirit to come up and you say, Pastor, could you pray for me? Because right now, I'm in a funk. I thought I was doing things right, but it was all superficial. It didn't even reach my heart. Because I was thinking things carnally, not spiritually. I want to be on the cusp to do everything that the Spirit of God wants me to do. Not make up my own decisions. I want it to be God's decisions. That when he calls me, I respond. Folks, hear me. You're in the army of God. Can you imagine a private sitting in his bunk? And the sergeant comes in and says, okay, guys, let's do five mile with backpacks and you say not today sergeant I got something to do today guess what you'll be peeling potatoes but why is it why is it that we can't do that in the real world but when it comes to God we make excuses why we can't serve him dads hear me because your, your wife and your children are watching you and whatever you do, they will do. And if you're seeing problems with your older children, guess what? It's because of you. They watched what you did while they were growing up, and now they're responding, and there's nothing you can do about it unless you change. This is hard preaching, but you're going to pay the price. I'm paying the price every day. I wait, cry for my son and my daughter. God, even though I know he forgave me, I still offer up the prayers. Hey, God, save them. Even if I don't have a relationship, I lost that opportunity. I gave it up. I deserve it. But Lord, save them like you saved me. You touched my life at 33 and changed me be, before, before I made those mistakes and now I'm saved. No, I can't turn the clock back. But I can live a life that brings honor and glory to Jesus. I want to pray. And if that's you, if you have not been given honor and glory to Jesus in your walk with God, you can't even raise your hands to praise God in church. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. It's not that you have sin in your life. There's something blocking it. It's the devil lying to you that you're not worthy enough to raise your hands. Because the devil's good at that. I want you to come up and we can pray together. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord. Lord, you've blessed this congregation. Twelve years we've been here, Father. Ups and downs, inside and out. People have come, people have gone. But, Lord, your word is still present. Hallelujah. You're the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And what you're doing, Lord, is you're taking your children and you're saying, sons and daughters, I have to allow these things to happen because I want you dependent on me, not on yourselves and your ability. It must be total surrender and saying, Lord, here I am. Let me be obedient and not make excuses about what I can't do. I want to be able to say, Lord, I can do. But Lord, that can't happen unless 
You convince my mind and change my thought pattern. Paul said it best. The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, those are the things I do. Oh, what a wretched man I am. Help us, Lord, in our thinking to do what is right. Come, if you feel the tugging of the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, I want to make it right because I want to be able to do what you've called me to do. Because you saved me before the foundations of the world. You called me. You put my name. You knew every hair on my head. And now here I am at this stage of my life. And I want to get closer to you. Amen and amen. If you're on live streaming, I want you just to lift up your hands and talk to God right now. I'll have a closing word in a minute. Come right now if you feel the tugging of the Holy Spirit. Don't look around. If you're looking around, you know it's you. Come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. You're still interpreting, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody here that needs to make a recommitment to Christ? You kind of like slid back and did your own thing. And you've gotten away from God. Stop reading your Bible. Stop praying. Stop giving. I mean, you, you're just doing your own thing. God's calling you. Make a recommitment. Make a recommitment. Amen. Sister. Look at me, saints. Look at me. Look at me. You made the honorable step in coming forward. Now what I want you to do is just hold up your hands. And talk to God and say, God, you know me more than anybody else. Search my heart. And if I've slipped and I've gone back to my old ways, take that desire away from me and put a desire to fall in love with you again. Let me stop arguing. Let me stop complaining. Let me stop blaming other people for my walk. I have to take responsibility for my actions. And then when I do something wrong, Holy Spirit, quicken me. Quicken my mind to repent, whether to my wife, to my children, to the people I live with. Don't let a day go by where you let this go. Because what happens, it'll start to crush your heart to where you don't feel the tugging of the Holy Spirit. And when you hear a message, it doesn't move you no more. Why? Because you're set in your ways. No, be on the brink. Be on the cutting edge. To say, Lord, I don't care how old I am. I want to seal. I want to have that pricking of my heart when I step out of line. Because I know you love me. Amen? Look at me. Raise your hands. Repeat after me. Jesus, I love you this morning. Help me, Lord, from this day forward, I make a decree. I'm going to surrender my thoughts to your thoughts. Help me, Lord, if I should slip aside, you're going to quicken me to come back. Don't let me drift away. Bring me back. Help me, Lord. Help me to tame the tongue. Sometimes it just does what it wants to do. I have to submit to you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a seat. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. You can have a seat. We're going to take an offering right now. Uh, Jose, you come up. Manuel? Thank you so much for joining us this morning and watching us on live stream. We'd like for you to partner with us with your tithes and offering and subscribe to us 
on YouTube and Facebook for future events. If you have a need right now, maybe someone's sick, maybe somebody in the hospital, right now we have somebody standing by on the computer and the phones that'll take your prayer request. If somebody got saved today on the message, we'll send you a Bible. Give us a call and be blessed. Thank you so much. Hope to see you again next Sunday. God bless.